I'm going to try something brand new today. I've never done this before. Uh, Y'all get to write the end of the sermon today. That's a little dangerous, isn't it? (laughs) Scary, somebody said, yeah. Uh, In the pew in front of you somewhere, you'll find just an index card like this. And uh, what I'd like you to do uh, during the sermon or whenever you choose to do it is just write something that you're thankful for on here. Uh, no, no, it's not big enough. Thank you for whoever said that. But give, give me something, you know, maybe just one item. And, and don't put your name on it. This is anonymous. And at the end of the message, uh, Vincent's going to help me. He's going to pick all of them up. We'll pass all the cards over to this side and... He'll bring them down here, and we'll, we'll write the end of the sermon from that. Uh, on the cover of your bulletin, uh, I sent this to Rita, and she used it quite well. It says it's got a little coffee mug and a uh, piece of paper there and a pen. It says, what am I thankful for? And We are in a week uh, that a lot of us are celebrating Thanksgiving. I remember in, uh, I guess I was in, uh, gosh, was it? High school, maybe? Junior high? I guess it was junior high and and maybe my first couple years of high school. I brought my mom with me this morning, by the way. So if there's anything you need to know, (laughs) she's she's the source right there, okay? Uh, And and she'll get most of it right. (laughs) That's my disclaimer. But every year we would go to Eunice and Bob Cooper's house for Thanksgiving. We did that for several years. Uh, when I was in junior high and high school. And, and I remember uh, they lived out on a farm in Howe, Texas, if you know where Howe, Texas is. And no, yes, yeah, some kind of south of Sherman a little way. But uh, Eunice was an excellent, excellent cook. They, they were farmers and ranchers, and they grew a lot of their own vegetables and stuff. And, and uh, she canned a whole lot of her fruits and vegetables and everything, which I thought was an interesting... Uh, term that we use canning, but we put everything in a jar. But anyway, uh, but our, she had the best cream corn. And she wouldn't cook it. It's just out of the, out of the jar and in the bowl and we'd eat it. And I, I just love that cream corn. But uh, Bob and Eunice Cooper are, are, are two people that, that I'm thankful for uh, in my life, not because of the Thanksgiving Day dinners, but uh, they're special people. Uh, we would go there. We weren't family related, but we were Christian family related. But uh, Bob and Eunice Cooper came to our house one weekend. Uh, years ago, I guess it was back in the mid-70s, and there was a revival. Our church was having a revival, and I was attending a church at a time. And they asked for volunteers to, for people to stay in the home. We need, we're going to house these people, and, uh, and we need volunteers to, to stay in the home. And so I... I raised my hand, not thinking to ask mom and dad first. <laughs> dad was not real happy about the whole thing. I'll just say that. And uh, he, he did allow me to go ahead and follow through with what I said. He was that kind of guy. If you're going to make a commitment, you go ahead and fulfill your commitment. But he, we were not going to have any more kids in the house. Three was enough, he said. So you're going to have to find an adult group that will come into the house, and you're giving up your room. So they can stay there, and you can sleep somewhere else in the house. That was a deal. And I'm like, okay, Dad was not a Christian at the time. And so uh, Bob and Eunice Cooper came to the house, and and, uh, they had such a gentle spirit about themselves. And I don't know how uh, Bob did this, but he actually got my dad to come to one of the revival services. And it was from that weekend that my dad met Jesus. And he was baptized, and he went on to go to uh, Dallas Christian College, and he was a preacher all of my adult life. And there's some other people that, that they never knew Bob and Eunice Cooper, but if they did, they'd be thankful for them as well. There was Steve Ellis and Janet Sager and Forrest Ewing and Jeff Sullivan and Teresa Gillum and Connor Harp, just to name a few. I had to go back and ask mom's help on some of this. Those people didn't know Bob and Eunice Cooper, but they'd be thankful for him because all those people were baptized by Dad. Isn't that how the Holy Spirit works? 
Amen? And a lot of us are thinking about people in our life right now that we're thankful for, and, and uh, for, for a lot of different reasons. But uh, it's just a time of, of thanksgiving, and those are folks that came to my mind as I had good memories of going to their house. Our passage this morning is going to come out of uh, Philippians, if you want to open your Bible to Philippians chapter 4. We're just going to look at a few verses there. And we'll start in verse 4. <clears throat> Paul is kind of wrapping up the letter that he's written to the church in Philippi, and he's, he's just finished trying to settle a dispute between two ladies in the church there when he starts this, this uh, new thought. And he says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And we're going to try to unpack this verse by verse here today just three or four verses. As I began to think about the idea that Paul is, is reminding these people in Philippi that they need to rejoice, I just couldn't help but wonder, well, why? Why is he reminding them to rejoice, and what's he reminding them to rejoice for? Well, to find that out, you have to go all the way back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. And I'm not going to read it all to you. Most of y'all will remember the story on one of Paul's missionary journeys. He finds himself in Philippi. It's a Roman colony. They're governed by Roman law. They dress like Romans the whole bit. And there's, there's not a place of worship there. So Paul does what? He goes down to the river in hopes to finding a group of people that might be praying down there. And he does. He finds some, some ladies down there. And you might remember one of them in particular. She was the, the seller of purple. Remember her? What's her name? Thank you. I love audience participation. That's why y'all are writing the end of the sermon today. <laughs> but Lydia was there, and she listened to what Paul had to say. And what happened to her? She, she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And Scripture tells us that she went on to be baptized, her and her whole family were baptized. And remember the jailer? He was in Philippi also. Paul got thrown in jail there, if you remember the story. And, and while he was in jail, there was a violent earthquake. And the chains fell off the prisoners. And the cell doors opened up. And when the jailer woke up and saw the doors open, remember what he did? He pulled the sword out of his sheath, and it made a noise. And, and from deep inside the jail... You hear Paul say what? Don't kill yourself. We're all here. I don't know. If I was in jail and the doors opened up, I might not be there myself. But that's what Paul said. And the jailer was astonished. And what happened in that story? Well, the jailer ended up listening to Paul, and he asked a question. What must I do to be saved? And we find out that the jailer was baptized he and his whole family, and when you look in Acts chapter 16, in that story, it said, and there was great joy. Well, I don't know about you, but think about, think about your baptism. As you came up out of the water, you're looking up, mainly because you don't, want to get water in your nose or something, but you're looking up, right? You're looking up, and I can't think of a better word to express the feeling that you have when you come up out of that water in baptism, but joy. Is that right? I mean, I don't know where you were baptized at or how that happened or came about in your life or who influenced it, but what I do know is that there were other people that were feeling joy as well. There may have been applause from the congregation, maybe a, some amens or hallelujahs. There might have been a song of praise. I don't know how it worked where you were, but there was joy, was there not? And so now as I read this passage, it makes all the sense in the world to me. Rejoice, he says, in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. He's just reminding them of the joy that they had when they came to know Jesus Christ. 
In verse 5, let's, let's, let's go on to verse 5. It says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. You can almost see him pointing his finger. The Lord is near. And again, I read that passage and I think to myself, why? Why put gentleness in here? We're experiencing great joy at this moment, and now you want me to be gentle in everything that I do. Let it be evident to all. He's asking us to behave a certain way. Well, again, go back to the Acts chapter 16 in the story there, and do you remember why Paul was in jail in the first place? He was telling the gospel message, right? He was preaching the good news, and he had this little girl following him, remember? The slave girl, that he, she was the fortune teller, and she was saying, he's, he's preaching the good news, he's trying to show you the way. I think she was doing it maybe in an antagonistic way, because Paul got a little irritated. Remember that? And what did he do? At one point, he turned around, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, and he cast out that demon. Well, that was great for the girl. It was great for Paul. It was not so good for the slave owners. And what did they do? They drug Paul into the city, and they called for the magistrates, and they told them that Paul's being a disruptor. He's a rebel. He's causing trouble. And they beat him right there. And then they threw him in the jail. Remember that? Now... When the jailer was done with him, he was baptized, and, and he took Paul home, and he fed him, and he bandaged his wounds, and he took him back to jail. The magistrates in the city told the jailer, hey, you can go tell Paul. He, he can go now. It's okay for him to leave. And, uh, and so the jailer, he's pretty excited about it. He goes back and tells Paul. He says, you guys can go now. And Paul, he says, nay, nay. <laughs> you are not going to get rid of me this easy. Am I embellishing this a little? Maybe a little? <laughs> Y'all are with me, though, right? He says, no. I'm not leaving that easy. You see, I'm a Roman citizen. Philippi was a Roman colony. You don't beat a Roman. You don't punish them. And you don't throw them in jail without a trial. And that's what they did. And so Paul, he claims his Roman citizenship, and he tells the jailer, you go back and you tell the magistrates that they can come to me, and they can give me a proper escort out of this city. So when the jailer gets to the, back to the magistrates, remember, they're thinking, uh-oh, because Roman law says when you do that, you get executed. That's what the magistrates are thinking is, Oh, man. So if Paul wants to push this envelope far enough, those people would, get, would lose their life. But that's not what he does, does he? What he does is he says, come to me and escort me out properly. He's showing them what? Gentleness. He's extending to them grace. And in this passage of Scripture... That's what he's telling the people in Philippi. Remember, remember to be gentle. Remember to show that because the Lord is near. Now, when I get behind the steering wheel of my truck and somebody cuts me off, I'm not always thinking in terms, I saw that, in terms of gentleness, okay? I have this Dr. and Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, personality. My wife, when she saw that, she said, who are you? Now, I don't wish them to die. I don't wish them oh, a great deal of harm, but maybe a little. <laughs> okay? Am I, is that smiled? Okay, anyway. But it's hard. When you're done wrong, you want justice. And what if it's your kid that gets done wrong? Oh, that's even worse, isn't it? We're not always thinking gentle thoughts. <laughs> We're not always wanting to extend grace, are we, when it's our kids? That's what Paul's saying here, is let your gentleness be evident to all. And I like how he finishes that thought as the Lord is near. In other words, he's watching. You brought that up in your song. He sees us. 
He knows our thoughts. He knows where we're at. He knows what we're doing. Uh, and that's what Paul says here. In verse 6, as we continue with this passage of Scripture, he says, Do not be anxious <clears throat> about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Do not be anxious. Don't worry. Now, I don't know. Do y'all write in the margins of your Bible? Y'all write notes? Maybe highlight some things? I do. And as I, I was reading that passage, I, I remember, and here it is. It's in, it's in pencil because I wasn't sure I spelled it right. Uh, I wrote Akuna Matata. Y'all see the show? Did y'all see The Lion King? Akuna Matata? What is Akuna Matata? What a wonderful place. Akuna Matata. Ain't no passing craze. Y'all singing a song with me in your head? It means no worries for the rest of your days. It's our problem-free philosophy. Akuna Matata. That's what I wrote down in my Bible. Because that's what he says, don't be anxious about anything. Be worry-free. Um, and that's hard. I don't know why it's hard, but it is hard. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he tells us that we're not going to be tempted beyond what we can handle, right? So I shouldn't be worried about things like that. He tells us in Romans chapter 28 that all things work together for the good of those who believe. So why do I worry? Why do we worry when we know that we have the grace of God with us. We do. I've been in the life insurance business for a very long time, and I've written a whole lot of life applications for people. And I would say, in a conservative way, 50% of the people that I come into contact with and write these applications are dealing with stress. They're dealing with anxiety. They're taking their happy pill. I take a happy pill when I fly. I have a lot of anxiety when I get on an airplane. I don't know what it is. If I'm cooped up in there, they don't give me the steering wheel. I don't know what it is. I've always thought if they put me in the cockpit, I'd probably be better. But they won't let me in. But we live in a society that I think that we do have a lot of stress. We do have a lot of anxiety. And we haven't figured out uh, how to deal with that maybe all the way. Paul gives us an antidote right here. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. And he tacks on this word thanksgiving, uh, present your request to God. And it's interesting when you think about that, to pray with thanksgiving. When you pray with thanksgiving, you're praying with an expectation that God is going to give you an answer. Is he not? You're praying with thanksgiving that whatever that answer is, it's going to be for your benefit, right? It's claiming, it's claiming the thanksgiving. It's claiming the prayer that you're praying. The other day, <clears throat> just to illustrate this in a very, very mild way, um, Terry let me go to the grocery store with her. She usually doesn't let me go to the grocery store with her. We're going to H-E-B. I think we were running some other errands, and we, she said, I need this and this, and so we pulled in H-E-B parking lot. So I'm pushing the basket. That's my job, and I'm not supposed to run into anybody or the back of her heels, okay? That's my, that's my you're with me, right? I just can't do that. Uh, I'm also not allowed to put anything in the basket, but sometimes that happens. But we're going down through the frozen food aisle, and they have these big bins, and I noticed some turkeys, and gosh, what's coming up? Thanksgiving, right? So I look in the bin to see what this turkey is going to cost me because we're doing something different this year for Thanksgiving. We're feeding a pretty good size of people, pretty good group of people number-wise. And I looked in there and saw the biggest turkey that I could see in there, and it was $60. And I thought to myself, well, we're going to buy a ham too. And then I got to thinking about all the other stuff we have to buy. And all of a sudden, my blood pressure goes up a little bit, and I start to get a little anxious about this whole thing. I'm like, my, why did I volunteer to do this? I'm going to have to go and borrow money out of my 401K. And then I got to think, man, if I borrow money out of my 401K, they're going to charge me $50 to get my own money. Can you believe that? That ain't right. And then I got to thinking about it. I thought, you know, Christmas is coming up. I'm going to borrow enough money out of my 401K. I might as well get cover Christmas covered too, right? Doesn't that make sense? If you're going to do that, you might as well get enough money that you can cover Christmas. I thought, man, 
am I going to get people for Christmas this year? I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll just get them all gift cards. That way they can go get their own stuff, right? And they don't have to take it back. And that makes sense. Yeah, I'll do that. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm just going to go get gift cards this year. And then I thought, all right, I'm going to go pick one of those gift cards up and I'm going to go to the self checkout line. And then it occurred to me, I'm going to scan that gift card. And I don't know about y'all, but I missed the customer training day when the stores were teaching you how to run their checkout count. Did y'all miss that too? I missed it. And so I'm envisioning myself scanning this, this gift card, and the idiot light goes off, and then this little 13-year-old comes over to help me to see if I need help. I'm like, yeah, I need help. I don't know what I'm doing. I missed your training day. They turn off the idiot light, and I'm thinking, oh, all this happened. All this happened when I'm looking at this $60 turkey. I made a, a decision right then and there, Mark. I was not going to the store with my wife ever again. <laughs> I get too stressed. <laughs> On the way out to the truck, I'm still thinking about those things. And it occurred to me, you know, I really should be more thankful. At least there are turkeys in the counter this year, right? At least there is food on the shelf that we can buy, and at least I, thankfully, Lord, I've got the resources to, to, to pay for the things that are coming up, and you've blessed me that way, and I'm thankful, and I'm thankful for the 13-year-old that can show me how to run their, their checkout register because with, without them, I wouldn't, I'd have had to steal that gift card. <laughs> Not really. But I have an awful lot to be thankful for. That's what Paul's saying. Let's not get anxious about things. Because when you start thinking about things that you're thankful for, and you start praying that prayer of all those things you're thankful for, all of a sudden that anxiety, that stress, it just kind of goes away. Does it not? I think that the next time you see a $60 turkey, you start thinking about all the things you're thankful for. Maybe it's not a turkey for you. Maybe it's something else. But you get what I'm saying? He goes on <clears throat> in verse 7, and he says, uh, the peace, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus as he's wrapping some things up here. The peace of God. Y'all had a lesson on peace not too long ago. A few weeks ago, I think one of the men from your congregation gave a lesson on peace. I watched it. It was a great lesson. The peace of God. Peace is you're not at war. You're not at war with God. You have relationship with God. Right now, that's the peace of God is that relationship that we have in him. Remember, coming up out of the water and you feel that joy, you are now at peace with God. And Paul goes on, he, see, he doesn't just leave it at that, he said that transcends all understanding, it surpasses. There is nothing greater than the peace of God. And I like this next part that he says. He says that it will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. When I think about that, I cannot think of a better protector than our Lord. Because that's what he's telling me right here. He is going to protect me. He's going to guard me. He's going to make sure that I am safe. Amen? One of my favorite uh, chapters and books in the Bible is Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul illustrates this through the Holy Spirit in his words, what that looks like to guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Start in verse 37 of chapter 8 in Romans. He says, now, or he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I've won some things in my life, different things, contests, that sort of thing. But to be more than a conqueror, 
<laughs> That's awesome. I don't know how to be more than a conqueror, more than a winner. That's what he's saying to you. Isn't it? We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. He is our protector. And so, in, in trying to wrap this up, I hope you've written something that you're thankful for on your cards. We're about to finish this sermon, and we can't go home until you, got, you guys write the end of it, okay? Um, so Paul, in these few short verses, there's almost like a math equation. Now, I'm looking out here. Some of y'all will remember this, and some of you are, are new math people, and you won't remember this. But do you remember, maybe it was the first grade or second grade where when we learned math, how to do it, it was in sentence form. And you do one plus two equal, and you'd write your answer in sentence form. You know, I think the new math was... You start the one, and then you, have, you stack them, okay? And it may have changed since then. I don't know. Maybe they use calculators now. I have no idea how that works. I was pretty good with, you know, the one plus two equal, but then they added a third number. You all remember that when that happened? They put the third number in the sentence. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to have to take my socks off to finish this one. <sighs> Paul gives us a sentence like that here. When you read it, he says, rejoice, plus be gentle, plus be thankful and not anxious, and God will be your protector. He's given us some things to remember, some things to dwell on, some things that we need to be reminded of sometimes. And when we walk out that door, we walk out into a world where there's Satan roaming around just looking for some way to create stress in your life. And here's the formula right here. We need a protector. And that's what Jesus Christ does for us. If y'all would, pass your cards this way. And Vincent's going to help me collect those. And we're going to wrap up this sermon with some things that all of us are thankful for. Thank you, Vincent, for helping me with that. Appreciate you. Now, I learned last time, I've, I've never seen myself speak before, but I, I was in my office one day watching myself on your, on your uh, YouTube and, and Facebook, and Terry comes in and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm watching myself. <laughs> And she says, why? I said, well, I've never seen myself speak before. And I didn't realize, uh, yeah, how much I was walking around. <laughs> and that poor guy at the camera back there, he's like, well, this dude walks around a lot. So today I've tried to be a little more stationary, probably a little more active with my, with my arms. But uh, I'm going to read some of these cards, uh, maybe, maybe not all of them. We have a lot, which is wonderful. And we have a lot to be thankful for uh, in our lives Thank you guys for helping me to finish this. Uh, <clears throat> this first card is, I'm very thankful that the sermon is over. <laughs> Mom, you weren't, Mom, you weren't supposed to write your name on this. <laughs> I'm thankful for a very supportive and loving husband. No matter what my trouble is, he's there. I'm thankful, thankfully blessed for God in my life. I am most thankful for God, thankful that he has impacted my life and the lives of my family, that his spirit teaches us to repent and be forgiven and to change our lives to become more and more like him. I am thankful for my family, husband, children, grandchildren. I am thankful for Promise Point Church, the 
people and the leadership who work very hard to make sure we are all taken care of. I'm thankful for all the women group, the, uh, the closest uh, the closeness we have, and thank you for the, the, the prayers that we've all received. I'm thankful for, the, for my family. I'm thankful for our church family. I'm very thankful for God's grace. Amen. That is a sermon right there. I'm thankful for the life I have full in the, in the Lord's blessings. I'm thankful for um, God. Uh, to reconnect with mankind, that he sent a Savior. Amen. You know, without that, we wouldn't have this, would we not? I'm thankful for Jesus. Amen. God has been faithful my whole life, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that uh, I was raised in a Christian church by my mom and dad. You know, that's a lot right there. There's a lot of folks out there not being raised in the church not being taught about Jesus Christ. You, you watch the news every night. <clears throat> Those aren't kids growing up in a Christian home. I'm thankful God gives us wisdom. I'm thankful my fa- for my family and my church family. I'm thankful for my family, for my health, and my friends. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my loving church family. I'm thankful for God's love. Amen. And I'm thankful for my family. I am thankful for my wife, my family, and my job. I am thankful for my family, my husband, and everything I have. I am truly blessed. I don't know who wrote that, but we are truly blessed when we think about all the things in life that we have to be thankful for. And I said things because we have a lot of things. We have a lot of people, too. I'm thankful for my loving husband. I'm thankful for my healthy children. I'm thankful for my, the hope I have in Jesus Christ. What am I thank, thankful for? Uh, this person would be like me. I don't know who wrote this, but they numbered everything. And I, I would have I done that. Uh, I'm thankful for family and grace, amen, and friendships and health and the blessings in my life, amen. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for... Uh, Gary and Erneva Ansel for uh, bringing Ron into this world. Wow. I owe somebody 20 bucks. Uh, <laughs> but I'm thankful for Jesus, eternal life. Thankful for my husband. I'm thankful for my son, my family, my friends. I'm thankful for curly hair. I'm thankful for mountains and rain and creeks and dogs, most of them. I'm thankful for Christians, my Christian sisters a way uh, God has provided for me in health. I'm thankful for 58 years with Marie. I'm thankful for family and kids and grandkids, my church family, mom and dad, and (laughs) H-E-B. Church, we have a lot to be thankful for, amen? Uh, I don't know who you thought of when you were thinking about coming out of the water in baptism. But you can be thankful for that person that introduced you to Jesus Christ. I know that. If you would pray with me this morning. Father in heaven, we are indeed blessed, way blessed beyond what we deserve. We are thankful, Lord, to be your children. We are thankful that you love us enough to give a part of, a part of you on the cross for us. We pray, Lord, that as we Remember all these things that we're thankful for, that we try to extend that thanksgiving to other people as well. And and to rejoice, Lord, in our salvation and to show our gentleness to others, even though they may not deserve it, help us to act more like Jesus. Help us to calm our anxieties, Lord, and to remember, remember you and be thankful as we pray for those things. Because, Father, you tell us and we believe you that you're our protector, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.